Uh, Sean, you need to go back and get all those uh, songs that are on the beginning of these tapes and make a tape out of all of them, like you did once before. Yeah, do it again. Do it again sometime. Go back through that. Wait a while and do that again. And that's a real blessing. I, uh, you did that with some of uh, those tapes from Pensacola, and I give those to Art Martin. I took him a set of tapes out there to Art Martin and to uh, Bruce McDowell. And uh, Art Martin wrote me a letter and said, uh, you don't know the blessing that was to my soul. Wrote me a letter and said, that was the biggest blessing I've had for years. He said, I just listened to it, listened to it, and listened to it. He said he really needed it. All right, take your Bible tonight and uh, turn to the book of James. And turn to James chapter 1. The name of my, my message tonight is uh, Symbols of the Word of God. Symbols of the Word of God. Now the Bible is pictured in different ways as symbols. And there's in a, some, a symbol to help you. And if you face the Bible as these symbols that are given in here, it'll be a great blessing to your soul. Uh, my, my boy, John... <laughs> Can't get over my Joel can't get over my pant leg being up. <laughs> oh, did I? Yeah. <laughs> oh, was I trying to get his attention? <laughs> oh well, praise the Lord. <laughs> you be good. <laughs> uh, you be good, and you be. Good. <laughs> Uh, no, I will take your car keys away. <laughs> oh, what, what's my alley? Oh, uh, that come from, uh, originally, it started from skiing down a hill on a set of skis. And it, and it messed that knee up. That's where it began years ago. And then I messed it up again playing racquetball. Uh, playing racquetball, messed it up playing racquetball. And I messed it up up there hunting with Chuck and Sean, pulling that deer up that, that hill, that five by five buck. And I was pulling it up the hill, and I twisted it like that, and twist and snap that knee, and pop that knee, and so when I walk, it pops, and it hurts, and it pops when I walk. And so I got a brace that I bought on there, and I have got a $75 brace on there to stiffen up that knee that I bought years ago when I heard it skiing. My wife says I'll put it on the outside, so <laughs> I suppose that's what she's probably right, but <laughs> there you go. <laughs> anyway, if a thing's hurt, you know one of these days the Lord's going to give us a new body. Going to give us a new body. I know he will. Amen? And if it isn't one thing, it's another. It all wears out. You lose your hair. <laughs> and uh, hey, it all goes eventually. It all goes eventually. Your, your, your knees, your kidneys, your eyes. You get diabetes. You get uh, cancer. Eventually the whole thing, it goes eventually. One of these days, the gonna, Lord's going to blow a trumpet. And what a body that's going to be. What a body that's going to be. 
And I suppose if the Lord left us in this body, we would uh, end up being pretty miserable creatures. If he left us in the body that Adam got after he got kicked out of the garden, it'd be a miserable life. Thank God I don't have eternal life in a fallen body. You follow me? A depraved body. Because uh, I even see, and you see, knowing yourself, there's things about this old man that he, he still hadn't got it yet. He's quit some old sins. Come on, hadn't he got rid of some of the old sins? But there's still that fight that's still there, and it's still is corrupt. But I'm not preaching on that tonight. I'm going to preach on something else. <laughs> James chapter 1 now. James chapter 1 and pick up verse 23. The book of James chapter 1. And verse 23, yeah, always keep a joyful spirit and always be able to laugh. Sometimes I'm a little too serious, and I, I realize that's not the best way to go through life. And uh, take yourself a little too serious. And you've got to learn to laugh and uh, learn to joke about yourself. And uh, so keep a good spirit and laugh. Never get too serious. Uh, always, uh, if something's funny, laugh, man. <laughs> Amen. I'm telling you the truth. If it's funny, laugh. And, and if a fellow, if you can't laugh at things funny, if they're funny, now there's something wrong. Always learn to laugh, even if it's laughing at somebody else, at their expense. Isn't it always funny when a guy falls down? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> now, isn't it always funny when some guy falls down or gets hit with a pie in the face? Isn't it always funny that somebody else gets hurt? That's a laugh. They've made thousands of movies about it. And so, uh, keep laughing, even at my expense, brother. <laughs> Amen? Y'all with me? And some things I'll say and do just to test you out and see if you learn how to laugh. Keep, so keep laughing. Amen, brother? Keep laughing. All right, here we go again. You pray for me. So sometimes that's easier preaching to do. Sometimes I'm, I need to preach it myself sometimes. Sometimes I'm a little too serious myself. All right. Uh, James chapter 1 verse 26 and here we go and it says for if any be uh, let's, let's go back and pick up verse 21 wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity and naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul and be ye doers of the word and not hearers only Deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened liken unto a man that beholdeth his natural face in a glass. Beholdeth his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I pray tonight that you would please wash me in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you would fill me with the Holy Spirit. And Father, I pray that you bless this message to your people. It'll be an encouragement to it. It'll be a strengthen them to them. And it'll help them. And it'll help them to be uh, better Christians and love you and love your book more. And Lord, thank you again for the opportunity to stand up for you and be counted on the right side. In Jesus' precious name I pray. And for his sake, amen. Now, here in the book of James, notice what it likens the Bible to. Look at verse 23 again. He's, For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened unto a man that beholdeth his natural face in a glass. Then the Bible is likened to you as what? Write it down. As a mirror. As a mirror. The Bible is pictured as a mirror. And so you go up and you look in the mirror and you see yourself in the mirror. So the Bible pictures a Christian. So you know what you're going to see if you get in the Bible? You're going to see yourself as God sees you. You're going to look in the mirror. You're going to go look at... Now if you went up and looked in the mirror and looked in the mirror right there, you'd say, Oh, well, 
<laughs> he's lost all his hair. Or, I don't quite look, I don't quite like that. But now if you went to the mirror, of God's mirror, and looked in the mirror, you would see yourself as God sees you. And that's where you really are. Now you say, preacher, how am I? I don't know how you are, but I know something. In this book, God would see you as you really are. And if you have a love for Jesus Christ, and a love for Him, and a love for spiritual things, and you get in the book, you know, some you'll see yourself in there as God really sees you. It don't really make any difference on how you look on the outside. That's really not the you. The real you is on the inside. And time after time after time, you know what I'm doing? I'm looking at people and I'm saying to myself, what do they look like on the inside? What do they look like on the inside? What do they look on the inside? What's that soul look like? What's that real them? What are they really like? And you know something? The Bible is that a way. So you want to see yourself? Go to the Bible and say, Okay, Lord, show me myself in the Scripture. Show it to me. Reveal it to me. And there you are. All right. Now I want to show you some things about yourself and about me. Take your Bible and turn to Mark chapter 7. And here's something every Christian should remember. And remember as he reads through... The Bible, uh, Mark chapter 7. Now look at this verse. And you should keep in mind these things. And look at verse 20. Mark chapter 7, verse 20. Now when you go to the Bible and, and go to the mirror of God's precious book and look at it and see it, you want to look for yourself as, as the Lord sees you. Now, in Mark chapter 7, in verse 20, it says, He said, That which cometh forth out of a man, that defileth a man. For from within, out of the heart of man, proceedeth evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile the man. Then what's that talking about? That's talking about my heart and your heart. That's revealed to us inside of us. There's inside of us. If you look in God's mirror and look in there, inside of us a heart, there's some things that are wicked. So you know what we always got to do? We always got to come to the Lord and say, Now wash my heart. Wash my heart. Wash my heart. Take your Bible and turn to Psalms chapter 51. Every Christian, when he comes to the Bible and sees himself time after time in the Bible, should always remember to pray this prayer. Psalms 51. In Psalm chapter 51, in verse 10 it says, Create in me what? Verse 10, create in me a clean heart. You got to watch your heart. You got to say, how's my heart? See in the mirror and look in the heart and say, now my heart's this way. How is my heart? My heart's always wicked. You say, preacher, are you talking to us? Yes, I'm talking to me. I'm talking to me. I'm talking about myself. You know what I'd do if the, if the devil allowed me and the flesh allowed me and the devil put it across my path? I'd do anything anybody else would do. You follow me? So what do you do? You go to the mirror and see yourself and look in the mirror and, and see yourself. You know, but there's times in the Bible when you can see yourself and you say, Lord, I did that verse and I did that verse and I obeyed that verse. You know, some, you could see something that was good and pure and something that was wonderful and something that was right. So often we look at people and, and we, we think people are, are how they are on the outside. That's not really how people are. People are not how they appear and how they look. People are what you are on the inside. That's the real you. And so I'm always looking at you. I'm looking at everyone. Every time I see you, you know what I'm always doing? I'm saying to myself, the inside, what's the inside? What's the inside? What's the inside? What's the soul? What's the spirit like? I, it's immaterial what you are on the, on the outside. It's, it's really absolutely immaterial. 
It's the inside that I look at and want to build. Go to the mirror and see the mirror. That's what you want to see. You say, preacher, it's beautiful. Is it? I trust it is. I trust it's beautiful and precious and something great on the inside. The mirror, that's a mirror. Go to the mirror and look in the mirror and see yourself. Sometimes you see things you don't want to see in the mirror. Sometimes you see that. But what do you do? Uh, the Bible says in James, it said, look, turn back to James chapter 1 again. Go back to James chapter 1. As you read through the Bible, you, you need to say, Now, Lord, show me myself. Show me myself. Reveal it to me. Show me how I am. The hardest thing to see is yourself. You know that? The hardest thing in the world to see is yourself. You say, I appear this way. No, you appear... It, you know the best way to see yourself is to see yourself as other people see you. See other... Because then you get a reality. You know, a lot of people go through life thinking they're a certain way, and that's not how you really are. You know the a ideal way to see yourself? How God sees you in that book, and you read through that, and you're saying, the Lord, show me myself. Show, my, show me in that book. You know, I'm reading the Old Testament, and I'm looking for characters in the Old Testament, and I see all those characters in the book of the Old Testament, I see now, that, why did that guy do that? And I say, well, that's human nature. That's in the heart. That's in my heart. That's kind of how we are. And they say, Lord, help me not be that way. Lord, help me not to be that way. Help me be that way. Go through the Bible like that. Turn back to James chapter 1 again, and I want to show you something. James chapter 1. And look at verse 23. For if any be a hearer of the word. Who's that? That's you here tonight. If any be a hearer of the word. And not a doer. He is likened to a man that beholdeth his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself. And goeth. Underline this. In verse 24. His way. Underline that. His way then you know what lots of times you do? You hear the Word of God, and then what you do? You go your own way. Instead of going God's way, you go your own way. You know what that guy is? That guy, he, he's not a hearer of the Word. You hear the book. Don't you hear the book in this church? Don't you hear it? Then if you're not a doer of the Word of God, you're like the fellow that looked in the mirror and forgot what kind of fellow he really was. Just went away and didn't do anything. So there ought to be some verses that you go through the Bible and say, Lord, help me do that verse. Help me do that verse. Lord, help me do that verse. And so there ought to be verses you obey. All right, again, take your Bible now and look at Psalm chapter 44. How do you look? How do you look to the Lord? How do you look? We are bombarded in this day and age with looks. With looks. Everything is, how do, you, how, does they, how do they look? How do they look? I mean, just bombarded crazy with it. So people are, are going and always looking in the mirror saying, <clears throat> how do I look? How do I look? I look pretty good, don't I? And you know something? The Lord don't really care how you look on the outside. People will see somebody walk in the church and say, oh, they're not dressed very good. So what? So what? You know what God's looking at? You say, well, they got to be dressed fancy. they got to be dressed nice. Why, brother, if you're dressed in a, in a white suit with white gold on it and shining off it and the heart wasn't clean, what would you look like? you got to take care of the heart. Take care of the heart inside. Some of the preachers say, you don't care. I don't care if a guy never wears a tie. You know that? Don't bother me a leg. Brother Mel, you got a tie on. That's fine. <laughs> I'm not against it now. <laughs> don't, don't, don't go the other extreme. Say, <laughs> if you don't wear a tie, I'm not bothered. You know how much I'm bothered? Not that much. Not that much. But you know, some folks they think if you haven't got a tie on, if you're not dressed a certain way, if you come in your coveralls or you come in your boots, somebody say, oh, you know, some something wrong there. God looks at the heart on the inside. That's the real you. Well, you look like on the inside. That counts. You follow me? Psalm chapter 44. Here we go again. Psalm chapter 44 and look at verse 21. 
Shall not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. Underline it in Psalms 44, 21. For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. God knows the secrets of my heart. You mean that? That's down inside. You know what we forget sometimes? We forget that God knows us better than we know ourselves. And understands us better than we know ourselves. So go to the book and see what you look like in the book. And go to the mirror and then say, Lord, I saw myself. And go away remembering what you saw. And be a doer of the word. It's a mirror. It's a mirror. I right, again, take your Bible and uh, turn to uh, the book of Jeremiah, chapter 23. Turn to Jeremiah, chapter 23. And here's another symbol of the Word of God. Jeremiah, chapter 23, and look at verse 29. Jeremiah 23, 29. Is not my word like, like as, see the two words, like and as. The two greatest words in the Bible are like and as. Is not my word like as a what? Fire. Fire. Then the Bible is like fire. It's like fire. You know, what do you mean it's like fire? Well, Sean and I and Brother Pope and I was out there on, on uh, the plains of Montana, out there hunting last week. And we was out there and it got down below zero. And we took some water out and the water froze. It was a little cold, <laughs> a little chilly. And went down through there and we shot uh, 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 two bucks and two doe. And we brought them back to camp. And two bucks, big bucks was stay laying there. And two does was laying there. And I said, you know what we need? We need a fire. So we built a fire and got that fire going. And you know something? With that cold out there and, and got to cut up all those deer and all those work, all that work. I stood around there and went like that against that fire and I thought, ah, how comforting it is. I mean, you get cold in the sins of this world. You get out there cold and loneliness when this old world says something criticizing you and ridiculing you and you feel like you're the only one around. That book right there is like a warm fire that'll comfort you so like nothing else to do. I can sit in the cab of the pickup and warm up. I can sit in the cab and turn on the heater and warm up and say, Oh, I'm warm in this cab. And I did that too. <laughs> but you know something? It wasn't like the fire. When I backed off from the fire, the hunting fire out there, and backed off from it, even when I couldn't feel the heat of it, all I could see was the light of it. You know something? It was comforting in that pitch darkness out there just to see that fire burning. Not even to feel the heat from it. Tell you something, that book is like a fire, like a comforting fire on the plains out there in the cold in the dark of this world. Sometimes you'll get in that book and you get out there and it'll be lonely and be miserable and you'll be darkness all around you with sin on every place. And that book will be like a light and a heat That'll comfort your soul. Gonna spend some time in it? Said, My word is like as a fire. Fire. Something about it. Something about it. We can go, sit there in the back of my pickup and we lit a stove there and lit that stove and that stove put out some heat. And I thought to myself, It's not like a fire out there with that wood and all burning up. Not like that fire. Warm up there and warm my hands and wipe off all that blood that went around everywhere, you know. And sit there with a the fire and warm up my hands and think to myself, nothing like a fire. What would a guy do if he was lost? Dennis Updegraff was hunting over there one year. And Dennis said he got lost. He got crisscrossed back and forth. And he got lost and didn't know where he was at. And there wasn't a tree anywhere in sight. And the wind was blowing across there and he had one of those blankets you know that's, that's silver on one side one of those blankets is silver on one side with your kind of a 
uh, life-saving blanket and a little backpack he had. And he said he put that backpack over him like that and put that thing across him. And he said he, they saw a fence post. So they went out and tore that fence post off the farmer's fence and lit that fence post to fire. And he said between that blanket and that fence post burning, he said, I stayed all night out there lost with a burning a fence post. And he said, you won't believe how comforting the burning of that fence post was for that little fire out there burning in front of me. And he said, in the morning I got up and walked a couple hundred yards and there was the pickup. <laughs> he found it, you know. One of those deals. You get lost and don't know where you're at and you wasn't just a few away. away. But isn't that life? You're out there lost. You're out there somewhere and it's in the dark of the night in the cold and the loneliness when you just want to give up and quit. And you say, oh, Lord, why, 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 why? And then you go to the book and it'll warm your soul. It's like a fire. Like a fire. It, but you know something? If it's like a fire, it'll also burn. It'll also burn. So sometimes when you go through that book and get in that book, sometimes it'll sure burn you. You've some of you ever been burnt by the preacher when he oh. preaches and burns sometimes? You go out and say, oh, boy. And burn your shoes off and go out there and just kind of tick and mad and burn you. Our book will burn you. But I'll tell you something, it'll burn a man in hell too. It's got to burn him in hell. Burn him in hell. So the fire is not just bad, but it's also good. I right, take your Bible and turn to Isaiah. It's, uh, uh, look at the rest of Jeremiah. Look at Jeremiah chapter uh, 23, verse 29. It says, Is not my word like a fire, saith the Lord? And like a what? Like a hammer. Like a hammer. What? That breaketh the rock in pieces. It's like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. So you know what that Bible's like? That's like something that comes like a hammer. Now what's a hammer for? A hammer, I think a hammer's for building things. Isn't a hammer for building something? But you know something he said here, a hammer is for breaking the rock in peace. What's that rock? That rock is the old stubborn heart. That old stubborn heart on the inside, like a hammer coming along just blam. Sometimes that book will just come along and it's like a hammer that just hits your heart and just breaks your heart. And soften it. You know what Christians need? They need a broken heart. You need to have your heart broken. And you need to have it broken by God. And that book where that old heart is just broken, where you bawl and cry and say, Oh, God, help me, help me, help me. You know what's wrong with Christians? They, they go a long, long, long time before they ever realize that what God is trying to do to you is God is trying to break you. Break you and make you. So He allows some very difficult things in your life to break you and make you. You say, Preacher, me, yeah, you. You're going to be broken? You're going to be broken? Or are you going to say, No, not me? It's like a hammer to break you. To break it and make you. Part of being a Christian that loves God and loves His book. Now, everything in that book is smooth and nice and sweet, like a hammer, like a fire. Take your Bible and turn to Psalms. I mean, Isaiah chapter 65. Here's a blessing. Take, take your Bible and turn to Isaiah chapter 65. Now, as I was told, told you last week in Sunday school, that there's texts that are taken out of context, and there's a spiritual application that Paul gives of text. Now, here's a great verse that in this context it doesn't apply to a Christian, but has great spiritual application. Don't you ever get to the Bible where you go through the Bible and say, well, doctrinally, that's Old Testament. Well, doctrinally, that's tribulation. Well, doctrinally, that's a millennium. You know what you'll do? you mess up on a lot of great blessings in the Bible. And you need to learn how to take some uh, the spiritual application of verses in the Bible like Paul did. Now, here's one. Take your Bible and turn to Psalms, chapter, I mean Isaiah chapter 65, and look at verse 24. Now, let's see the context. Look at verse 25. Now, somebody tell me the context. 
The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullocks. What is the context? Is that the church age? Definitely not the church. Is it the tribulation? It's definitely not. But now let's read the verse in front of it. Now apply the verse as a spiritual application to a Christian as you and me. Now here we go. This is the spiritual application for my soul and your soul. And it shall come to pass, verse 24, and it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they yet speaking, I will hear. Now, isn't that a blessing? Before they call, <laughs> before you even pray and ask for it, the Lord has already answered your prayer and always heard your prayer is already answered and it's on its way. Just don't get excited because the answer is already coming. You know, sometimes we want to run ahead of God. Don't run ahead of Him. The prayer has already been answered and it's on its way here and you haven't even prayed yet. And that a shot. <laughs> and I haven't even asked for it. I haven't even prayed about it. And it's already, the answer is already coming. God knew what I needed before I even asked for it. Now he answered for it. She said, so preacher, I, did, I haven't even prayed and fasted and meditated. God knows what you need before you even need. And he's got the supply coming. Just wait on him. It's on its way. Just wait on him. And what we do, we want right now, here in a second, oh Lord, I can't wait a second. Just wait on God will supply your need. And he'll supply it above and more than you can even imagine. You say, well, he give me what I need. Yeah, and he'll give you what you want too. I found out that God gives me a whole bunch of my wants. And I don't need it a lick, but he's fulfilled my wants. I need food and remnant. And he's given me a whole lot more than that. Again, take your Bible and turn to the book of Hebrews and turn to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. And Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the Bible symbol is, is like this. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing of the sunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints of the mire and is a, what is it? It's a sword, but what does it do? A discerner of the thoughts of the intents of the heart. You want that book to show you? The intent of the heart. What that heart, what's the intent of the heart? I mean, what you really desired, well, I mean, the real, what you intended to do, the real intent of your heart, what you really intended. You know, some, I can scare a guy. Because that book there discerns you. It, it got, it's got your number. It's like a sword. You know how I do? I always think a fellow ought to have a knife. So I carry a knife in this pocket. I believe a fellow ought to always be prepared so I always carry a knife in this pocket. And they always get dull. So I, carry, I got about 10 or 15 of them. So I go to my drawer and when that gets dull, I take it out and I, it's not, a, you say, you say, you preacher, you believe a man ought to have two knives? A man ought to have two knives. And I always carry one in that pocket and I always carry one in that pocket. I always have one. You know what it is? It's a sword. A person always ought to have the book and ought to face that thing like a knife and they always ought to keep it sharp and always ought to have it ready and prepared and ready to cut. That's a sword. That book is like a knife. You say like a sword? Like a sword. Reach in that pocket. Always have it ready. You say, would you cut somebody with it? Oh, I doubt if I'd cut anybody with it. I, I don't think I would. <laughs> I hope I never have to. But I'm prepared. I'd just soon cut a man with that book. 
I, I don't care a whole lot about cutting him with this. I don't really, because you know something, if you cut a guy with this, you get cut back. Right? You can always count on it. You get cut with this, you get cut yourself. You don't, you cut him, he's going to cut you. I'd just soon cut a man with that book right there. It's a sword. Double-edged sword. Are you using it? Using the book? You take the book, you got ready the book, you memorize the book, and you got the book down enough where you can take and cut a fellow with it? Say, thus saith the Lord! Or is it just a book that you never use? You ought to cut a guy. You ought to prepare him. You know something when you cut a guy with that book? You ever get cut out there? I was out hunting this week, and I got a cut right here. I got a cut right there, and I got a cut right there. That knife, you're slicing that knife all over the place, and that hand's all cut up. Come on. <laughs> you cut up nine deer, and you know something? You get cut yourself. You take that book right there, and you cut somebody with it, and cut somebody with it, and cut somebody with it. You know what you're going to do? In the process, you're going to get cut yourself. But it'll be good for your soul. You know how you save a man's soul? Cut him! You want to save a man's soul? Cut him with the book! You know how to let him go to hell? Never cut him. Tell you how to cut a fella. Cut him and throw him a little salt. You say, how crude. I'm talking spiritually. I've got the spiritual application. Cut him with the book and then rub in a little salt. You know what Christians do? Christians say, well... You're going to hell. You need to get saved. No. You're going to go to hell and you're going to burn and you better get saved. And then you cut him with the book. You make all the difference in the world. Pull a little salt in. You say, what for? To save the man's soul. You know, my brain and my opinion don't amount to that much. As far as convicting that man, that book will bring conviction. That book will show him he's lost. That book will do something. I preach up at the jail. You know when I preach up at the jail, you know what I keep having in my mind? That book will make a difference. That book will make a difference. And that book will make a difference. I got about 12, 13 guys there every time we Sean and I go up there and either he preaches or I preach. And I'll have those guys sitting there and I think the book will make the difference. The book will make the difference. The book will make a difference. And I say, take your Bible and turn to this verse. And so here's this jailbird out there. And he's got this Bible, and he's opened up this Bible, and he probably hadn't looked in the Bible for 10 years, you know. <laughs> and he's looking down this Bible, and he says, What shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And I say, Now, Lord, cut him, cut him, cut him, cut him. And he's looking at, You say, You think that's going to do something? I believe that's going to do something. Now, use it as a sword. All right, take your Bible. And turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. The Bible's pictured here as 1 Peter chapter 1. Look at verse 23. The Bible is uh, sim symbolized by this thing. 1 Peter chapter 1. And look at verse 23. Verse 23 and it says. Being born again. Not of corruptible seed. But of incorruptible. By the word of God. Which liveth and abideth forever. Then what's the Bible pictured as? It's pictured as seed. It says in the Gospels, it said, The sower went forth to sow the seed. And some fell by the wayside. Brother, put out a bunch of Gospel tracts with the Word of God in it. Some fell by the wayside. Some fell on stony ground. Some fell among thorns. But some fell on good ground. Every time you put out a gospel track, it's going to fall and bring forth some results. What are your chances? One and four? One and four? Your chances is one and four? That's not too bad. One and four. Go out there and sow the seed, sow the seed, sow the seed, sow the seed. Put out the book. Put out the Word of God. Put some gospel tracks. I think Greg Hawk went up to the high school and went down through the lockers and put gospel tracts in all the lockers up at the high school. <laughs> what do you say? 
Amen, brother. <laughs> you say, I say, you can do an awful lot of things if you don't get caught. And if you do get caught, just plead ignorance. Just play dumb. You can get away a lot playing dumb. Amen, brother. Just way, just kind of act a little. Say, oh, 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 okay. And you can get away with a lot of track putting out. Even if it's a hundred dollar fine for putting them in cars in the city limits. See, it's a hundred dollar fine. Yeah, I'll pay the cost, and so the seed. It's incorruptible seed that is living. That book is sowing the seed. It's been sowed in somebody's heart and it'll bring forth eternal life to their soul. It's a living book. It's a living seed. The seed sometime or another was sown in your heart by some preacher or Sunday school teacher or soul somewhere that sowed the seed in your heart and it brought forth eternal life in your soul. So, sow the seed in a Sunday school class or in a gospel track or wherever you can and it'll bring forth seed to the saving of a man's soul. Why? Because it's not corruptible. It's living. Not right there, a living book. You know what it's like? It's like I had a house in Denver, Colorado and underneath the house there was a furnace. It was all dirt underneath that house. And I had to dig it out and put in a new furnace because the furnace went bad. And so I dug it out and put a new furnace in that house that I had in Denver. And I took the dirt out there and I carried it and put it in the front yard. And you know what come up in the front yard? Radishes. <laughs> Radishes in the front yard. Where did they come from? Underneath that house. Somebody put some radish seeds in a dry place in that house. And when it got moisture, they came up. Go out and sow the seed. And one of these days it said they'll bring forth moisture. Remember the parable over there in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that said they lack moisture? Give them some moisture, give them some prayer, and they'll bring forth fruit into the saving of a man's soul. It's like a seed. Again, take your Bible and uh, turn to uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. It's like what? <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26 says, Washing of the water by the word. The washing of the water by the word. What is the Bible like in the washing of the water? It's like a nice shower. It's like a nice bath. It's like a, a cleansing and a washing. So when you get in the Bible and go through the Bible, you know what? When you read through the Bible, you know what you do? You wash yourself. You cleanse yourself up. I went out there and went hunting with Brother Pope and John. We was out there and Monday night it was raining down, just as coming down and mud was about that thick and we hated to get out of the pickup. And I crawled back through there and got up in my sleeping bag and I said, no shower tonight. Monday night, no shower. Tuesday night, no shower. Wednesday night, no shower. I had a beard going down there like that, you know. Same clothes. <laughs> Same clothes, you know how that goes. <laughs> Same socks. <laughs> See, wait a minute. <laughs> That's why my wife don't go hunting. <laughs> And then Thursday night, we went to the motel. I got in the shower and washed off, and I said, Ha, ha, ha! Woo! To be clean again. I was glad to take a shower. You know what some Christians do? You know what they do? They go days and days and days without ever taking a bath and getting washed in the book. How about you? Been washed in the book? When was the last time he was washed in the book and cleansed from head to toe? When was the last time you took a nice shower and got washed and cleansed up and made clean with the book? When was the last time? Huh? 
Gotta get you a shower. Clean up. Smell good before the Lord. And, and be clean. And he said, that book will cleanse you. Get out there on the out there on the desert and go cut a deer up and gut him. Oh, bloody mess. <laughs> blood running out of here and down your sleeve and, and blood all over your hands and you can get it on your knees, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, I can't mess. And then you say, oh, for some water to wash myself in. And you're out there, and you're, you're, you're miles from camp. In the back of the pickup, where's the water in the back of the pickup? Nowhere to be found. You take a rag and wash it off with a rag, and, and you know what you do? You reach down there, and you get that snow. And you take that snow, and you put that snow on there, and you wash that snow... And it'll really surprise you what that snow will do. You say, snow, water! The washing of the word. You know what some Christians do? They never get washed in the book. Their hands are filthy, and their bodies are filthy, and they're dirty from top to bottom, and they're never... Oh, you say, preacher, I take a bath every day. See, you missed what I was talking about. You missed it all together. I'm talking about the washing of your soul and your spirit and get you clean up on the inside. You see? Spend some time in the book. Again, take your Bible and it's like this. Turn to, uh, turn to Psalms 119. Turn to Psalms 119 and 105. Psalms 119 and 105. Now look at the verse. Psalms 119 and 105. And it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a what? And a light. A light. Get out there on the plains of Montana and it's dark. And it clouds over and you can't see it star and you can't see the moon and you get out there walk about a hundred yards from the camp and then see how dark it is man it's dark get out there in the the camp I got that camper brother sealer that light you put in that shell man that thing was a lifesaver you ever got up and tried to dress in the dark have you ever tried to dress in the dark when you can't find your shoes and you can't find your clothes and you can't find nothing that's pitch dark and you reach over there in that camper light and you flip on that camper light and that thing just is like daylight. Man, what a nice light. You know something? That book right there is like a light. It'll light you up. You ever been lost in the night time? I got lost out there. I was hunting one year out there east of the mountains. And I shot a big old buck. And I shot him, put a hole in him. Went up there and there was blood right there, all over. Blood running everywhere. And I chased that deer down there. And Gary says, you go down there and get the deer. And I'll take the pickup and go this way. And I went down over after that deer. And I was walking out after him. And pretty soon it got dark. And it was clouded over I mean, it was so dark, I couldn't even see the ground in front of me. Couldn't even see the ground in front of me. And I said, I'm walking in a plowed field. And I said, oh, what I would do for a flashlight. About now, about that time, off here about 100 yards, I heard what sounded like 100 cows, but it wasn't, (laughs) probably about four or five. And I could hear them chewing on that deer. And boy, I'll tell you, they just scare the life out of you. And I'm out here and saying, where is that road? Where is Gary? And where in the world is that road? And I'm walking and walking and walking and walking and walking and walking. And all of a sudden, I look out there and I see some car lights. And boy, the feeling that come to your soul when you see some car lights. And you're lost. Or you don't know where you're at in a pitch dark. That light right there, brother, will bring some grace and some peace to your soul when you see the car lights of that book like nothing else in this world will. The light into my path. You want to see where you're going? 
<clears throat> turn on the light. It'll do the job. All eyes closed and all the heads bowed. Christians praying tonight. The Bible is a, is a mirror to see yourself in. And look at the mirror. And see how you really are. You know, some, a lot of you are a lot better looking than in the book than you are any other way. And you need to look at yourself as God looks at you in the book. A lot of, you know, some, there might be some pretty souls on the inside. I believe there is. I believe there are some pretty souls. Some pretty souls. And I look at you and look at you in the book and see you. I bet there'll be some beautiful souls. And, but maybe not. Maybe not. How about it, Christian? Have you been to the book and saw yourself in the mirror? Have you gotten a bath? Have you been washed in the Word? Have you washed and got cleansed from the top of your head to the bottom of your toe? Have you went to the Word and got warm beside the bath? Have you flipped on the light and got the book? When's the last time you got out of the book and said, Lord, show me and direct me and guide me and warm my soul and help me. I need to be warm beside the fire of your book. Things in life, brother, you know what they are? They're a heartache and a sorrow and a failure and a disappointment. And that book will encourage you and strengthen you and warm you and wash you. How many of you here tonight? So, preacher, God spoke to my heart tonight and I need a washing and I need a warming. And I need some light from his book. And I want you to pray for me. God will give me those verses. And give them to me. And I need them. And I'll search for them. And I'll look for them. And ask God to give them to me. And will you pray for me about it? Will you raise your hand? Amen. 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 Now get to washing. And ask God to give you to them. Lord, every hand that was raised this evening, Lord, give them the verses to wash them and warm them and give them the light. And Lord, just put the verse upon them. And Lord, help them to memorize those verses. Lord, help them to hide those verses in their heart, Lord. And Lord, help them to get them. And Lord, may there be a blessing to their soul and to their mind. And Lord, help them meditate upon them and be successful in your sight. In Jesus' precious name I pray. And for His sake, Amen. Let's all stand. Take your hymnal tonight. Turn the page. Lord Jesus, I pray you'd bless your people this week. Pray you'd encourage them, Father. I pray that you'd give them a blessing from the book this week. And Father, help them to go to the mirror. And Lord, see themselves as you see them, Father. And Lord, I pray that you'd help them to be doers of the word and not hearers only, Father. And Father, I pray that you would help them to warm themselves beside the fire of the word of God. And be encouraged and be strengthened, Father, by your book. Lord, give them the verses, Father, as they go through it and search and find the verses for their soul. In Jesus' precious name I pray and for His sake. Amen. Amen.